Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, Friday, May the 22nd uh, media advisory. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in and thank you for the media for uh, participating as well. I'd like to uh, thank our special guests today, Rob McIsaac, President and CEO of Hamilton Health Sciences and Winnie Doyle, Executive Vice President of Clinical Operations and Chief Nursing Executive at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton, who are joining us to answer uh, any media questions around the current situation at some of our congregate care settings uh, in Hamilton. So they'll be uh, speaking uh, a little later on. Uh, yesterday, the, uh, we hosted a virtual meeting of uh, MPs and MPPs to discuss some of the uh, challenges that uh, we are facing the city of Hamilton and how we're gonna keep our workers and residents safe as businesses and public spaces uh, begin to open up as well. So the financial impacts were outlined for them. And uh, I think they have a good understanding of what some of our Hamilton challenges are. And we certainly hope that they will advocate on our behalf for at both the federal and provincial governments to see if we can maintain our services and also maintain uh, reasonable costing for municipalities. The federal government uh, will be investing in more testing and contact contact tracing and data collection. So new COVID-19 cases can be more quickly detected and isolated. The government has trained uh, people to contact trace who can make some 3,600 calls a day, so seven days a week. So that's, that's a fair bit of testing, some 20,000 calls per day overall through StatsCan uh, through available staff, which I think is a, a, a positive step forward. Uh, the federal government also announced a $305 million uh, new distinctions based indigenous community support fund to address the immediate needs in our indigenous communities. Uh, it includes a $75 million support for indigenous organizations that provide services to ind indigenous people living in urban centers and off the reserve. So a very positive and very important investment as well in that sector. The uh, provincial government announced last month that the $20 million Ontario COVID-19 uh, rapid research fund would, was going to be put in place and that's uh, going to be funding towards a Ontario based research projects uh, looking into various aspects of uh, COVID-19. The first phase of these projects is an investment of $7.2 million uh, that was announced this past Thursday. The first phase includes uh, 15 proposals accepted by the government which includes a rapid testing method put forward by St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton and a McMaster University study of recovered patients to examine antib antibodies and if they help prevent the spread of COVID-19. So important research projects and some local funding opportunities as well. Some of the city updates today, the uh, Emergency Operations Center approved the reopening of skate parks in our city. And I haven't been on my skateboard for quite some time and I may, may still keep it that way, but lots of other people would be interested in uh, getting onto those skate parks. So uh, they're gonna be open and uh, we're gonna be maintaining these sites, uh, but people need to continue to adhere to the, the physical distancing uh, rules and requirements. So, uh, you know, all the measures that are in place relative to no matter where you go are in place, no matter what we open uh, in our community. So please maintain that physical distance, distancing and hand washing and all the other good public health requirements that are out there. And that applies to uh, tennis and pickleball courts uh, as well. Uh, staff have been contacting the various clubs throughout the day to share the guidelines that have been developed by public health. And so we're hoping that uh, they too will adhere to those guidelines to ensure that we prevent any kind of unnecessary spread, but, but allow them to open and people get busy uh, entertaining themselves at some good athletic activity. Golf courses, uh, Kings Forest opened on Wednesday and Shadok will open this weekend. And for more information on uh, you know, getting tee times or booking times, hamilton.ca slash golf, if you need more information. And we'll continue to provide any uh, further updates on other outdoor recreational amenities as they become available. And that's certainly an ongoing process. So there are many that are still not open. Unfortunately, the city will be refunding everyone who had booked summer camps. We are uh, continuing to review what summer and drop-in programming might look like this year. So uh, stay tuned, there's more, to, more information to come on that, but uh, as it stands right now, uh, all summer camp uh, bookings are to be refunded. A reminder that the city is starting regular weekly leaf and yard waste collection on Monday, May the 25th. 
In other words, uh, the, the regular collection system, uh, if you were getting garbage collection on Monday, then you put your leaf and yard out on Monday and Tuesday, et cetera, et cetera. So no more once a week collection uh, through a whole district. It's uh, on your regular collection day. Another reminder that the uh, waterfalls remain closed. Uh, it has been particularly difficult to prevent people from congregating in these areas. It was a problem pre-pandemic and it certainly continues to be a problem today. Far too many people accessing these facilities uh, and congregating in inappropriate ways and obviously leading to what could be a, a spread of this virus. So waterfalls are closed. The lookouts and trails at the head of those uh, entrance ways are also closed. Uh, and we encourage people not to go there uh, to avoid any kind of uh, major congregating that, uh, as you know, can continue to spread the virus. On May the 20th, 2020, a city council approved a modification to the city's monthly pre-authorized payment plan to allow taxpayers wishing to enroll in monthly prepayment authorization payments, the ability to do so even if their April 30th installment has not yet been paid. So taxpayers uh, need to enroll in the monthly pre-authorized payments before June the 30th and to begin monthly pre-authorized withdrawals in July. Uh, the monthly pre-authorized payments are purely optional the modifications to allow inclusion of the April 30th installment simply provides a greater flexibility and assistance during this unprecedented, unprecedented time. So to find out more, you can go to hamilton.ca slash coronavirus slash frequent facts property taxpayers. Uh, get on the website. Uh, all the information uh, that is available for you in terms of taxation is on the website for you to utilize. And lastly, uh, Hamilton reopens, the Hamilton reopens plan will be presented to council next Wednesday's council meeting. Staff have been working hard at uh, a reopening plan when and if that happens, that uh, will we'll coordinate how we follow the provincial orders and, and all the guidance that they put forward, all the protections that need to be put in place so that when the province says it's good for us to open and if our public health says it's the right thing to do, that we have a plan to get people back to work and get our facilities back up and running. And so that, uh, that plan will be put on the table at council next week. Uh, it is not a plan that is going to be immediately operational. It's a plan. Uh, it, it, it still requires the province of Ontario to lift orders and it still require, requires the blessing of our public health, Dr. Elizabeth Richardson and their team to ensure that uh, we're opening up at this moment in time based on the data in terms of the spread of the virus indicates that it's appropriate to do. Uh, right after that council meeting, we will have a town hall that, uh, that very night at 7 p.m. And we can at that point review the highlights of uh, that entire plan. I'm gonna turn it over to our emergency operations uh, manager, Paul Johnson, to give us some more updates from the city perspective. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, you know, first off, to pick up on your, your last uh, remarks, um, we have been working very hard over the last couple of weeks uh, on this roadmap to how city services and, and ultimately we hope that city facilities will begin to, uh, to reopen and, and become more available to, to the public. And I just wanna thank uh, publicly all of the staff uh, here at the city of Hamilton that were involved in that work. And it was a great collaboration between the operational di divisions and, and sections of our city, our public health professionals who helped uh, guide us along the way. Uh, and this is, um, really going to provide a good framework for how things will unfold as the province moves through its uh, uh, several stages of, of re reopening or uh, work that we can do to have more people uh, more active in the community. And uh, this will help us uh, guide us along the way. And it's going to be everything from the services that you experience each and every day uh, at your doorstep um, uh, through to things like how uh, council will operate and when we can see council getting back to more of its normal uh, pieces, which, um, which will be a while before we see in-person council meetings, in-person uh, gatherings within our city. But we need to look at how that's going to happen uh, over time. Uh, it will be publicly available as all information is that goes to our, our committees and council. Um, I understand by the end of today. And so the public will have a chance to look through the document and, and understand uh, where the EOC's uh, thinking was at. 
And I think it's really going to be a strong expectation setting document about um, what, this, what uh, those who call Hamilton home or do business in Hamilton or are studying in Hamilton, uh, what they can expect from their municipal government. But the other side is it will be very clear what we expect in terms of the behavior and the interaction with services uh, of the public as we move forward. Uh, very few things will be uh, exactly as they were back in January and February. Uh, this is about uh, a plan of change and modification in the way you access services and programs here at the City of Hamilton. So thanks to all that were involved. Um, the public will have a chance to review that as will our, our council and then uh, we'll speak to it next Wednesday and, and really excited that actually what will kick off that piece before we get into our report is uh, Dr. Richardson providing a, a broad look at uh, the public health element of this pandemic, uh, how this virus is moving through the community, what we've learned in these first uh, eight, nine, ten weeks of, uh, of the real crisis moment of this and also what public health has been learning who have been doing work in this area uh, for even more time since the first cases were, uh, were uncovered um, uh, earlier in the year. So it's going to be a good, I think, explanation and opportunity to share information about the way this virus is changing life as we know it now and what our new reality looks like as, as we move forward. Uh, today, as uh, the mayor notes, we have some, some uh, guests uh, with us, and I know that a big topic of conversation um, over the last week has been the situation in congregate living settings, and in particular, uh, the actions that uh, we needed to take as a community uh, last uh, Friday into early Saturday morning. I want to begin uh, before I add a few remarks and talk a little bit about uh, what we've learned this week as we've debriefed on this on this issue. I want to start by saying that uh, really a lot of praise and credit has to go to many, many people who are in charge and in, in control of congregate settings, everything from long-term care to retirement homes to residential care facilities, group homes, emergency shelters and the like. Uh, by and large, they are doing amazing work. You've heard us talk about the fact that we do not have outbreaks in our emergency shelter system. Uh, you will note that uh, the vast majority of our residential care facilities, our retirement homes, our long-term care facilities do not have outbreaks within them. But uh, there are instances that do crop up that we've seen in this community where there is um, where, where, where things happen, uh, outbreaks occur. And in the case of the Rossland Retirement Home, uh, the community had to come together and do something that we have not done in this community to date, and that is fully, uh, fully um, uh, evacuate, decant, whatever word you want to use, a facility and help keep people safe. So the lead up to that Friday, uh, which was uh, the 15th, uh, really was an acknowledgement that there was an outbreak at this home. That occurred uh, first on May the 10th and continued into May 11th when the first and second positive cases uh, were found. Uh, they were found in hospitalized patients and uh, reported to public health. And that kicks in a lot of things that happen naturally in any environment. And I can speak from the personal experience. Of course, the municipality operates two long-term care facilities and we have had to interact with public health on occasion when we've had positive cases, thankfully, um, no major outbreaks in our long-term care facilities. But when we have declared outbreaks, we've had to work directly with public health. That is an immediate action that happens. And that did occur. It also is kicking in additional activity in the community as the province, uh, healthcare providers and municipalities recognize that we have to be very proactive in congregate settings if we're going to stop and curtail the spread of virus in these settings. And again, whether it's a homeless shelter, a long-term care facility or anything in between, uh, it's a collective effort to do a few things. One of those is to really assess the infection prevention and control methods. And I'm gonna talk, uh, let uh, Dr. Richardson in a couple minutes talk more in detail about what we do uh, when either public health or our healthcare partners and hospitals are on site doing that work. We also though talk very openly in, and, um, and bluntly with care facilities about what are their staffing plans uh, should outbreak occur. Uh, it's obviously a scary time. Sometimes it can lead to, as it did in the case of the Roslyn, staff becoming COVID positive as well and not being able to work. And it's really incumbent on congregate settings to understand what their staffing plan is. Wonderful to say we're all good now. What happens if people become positive? What happens if you're in outbreak and people become scared to come to work? How are you doing? And of course, alongside those infection prevention and control assessments is really understanding the use of PPE and stopping spread. And sometimes that's about PPE itself, but other times it's about the processes that keep people from um, uh, moving around too much that have proper screening for people coming in and out. And of course, in some of our settings, uh, folks are very mobile. 
Uh, they're not required to stay inside. It's not a locked facility. These are custodial situations and such is the case in places like retirement homes. As we moved through the week last week uh, into May 13th and 14th, it became clear that A, there was more cases and more spread of this. Uh, B, that there was um, at times a not a strict adherence to some of the, the guidelines around infection prevention and control. And that led to public health issuing some orders. As the week further prog progressed, staffing became a major challenge. And on Thursday and Friday, there were deep conversations held uh, with a number of parties and the Rosslyn Retirement Home about what their staffing plan was. On Friday, May the 15th, uh, many of those plans uh, simply could not be actioned. There weren't people to work. Uh, the majority of the staff, and, and at the end of the day, all of the staff that were working at the Roslyn were testing positive for COVID. And so we were left in the situation where there was no sustainable staffing model uh, to, to continue on. On top of that, there were some health issues. Uh, yes, COVID exasperated it a bit, but other uh, basic care issues for, for uh, residents in the Rosslyn that were becoming harder and harder to manage uh, through decreasing numbers of staff. And I think it's important for the public to note that there were home and community care staff, primary care physicians, hospital staff on site in those last couple of days trying to do their best to figure out ways to stabilize. I can tell you our first principle in working through these issues as a community is how do we stabilize the home so people can stay in their home. And uh, unfortunately, after a series of calls and a series of consultations, uh, listening very closely to those who are on the ground, fully donning PPE and working in the Roslyn, uh, the difficult decision was made to uh, decant the entire facility uh, to appropriate space. For the vast majority of the residents, that meant hospital. Um, a couple of the residents chose to make alternative arrangements. Uh, I understand it might've included hotels or some other arrangements with family members. Um, I don't have the absolute uh, information on that, but the vast majority went to, to, to our two healthcare facilities or hospitals in this community uh, through St. Joseph's and Hamilton Health Sciences. The debrief information that uh, the city was a part of, along with public health, our hospitals, primary care, home and community care, uh, the operators themselves um, along the way, and then the debrief that we had after this situation where we ga gained more information uh, really highlighted a few things for me, and I'll end on this. Uh, first is there did seem to be a lack of, of uh, true understanding and the training and the knowledge around how, in, how important infection, infection prevention and control is. Uh, processes like how to screen people coming in and out uh, simply were not happening. And that uh, encourages spread within a home. And once you have that outbreak, it is incredibly important that that iron ring that you've heard the Premier talk about is clamped down in terms of these facilities to ensure that uh, people stay safe. At times, conflicting information was provided. At one stage, it was enough PPE was there. And then, of course, we found out there wasn't. Quickly, we were able to find PPE, but it also appeared that PPE was, was not always being used in the most appropriate way within the home. And then, of course, on the night of May the 15th, uh, it was a chaotic scene. There were not good census uh, information about how many people were there, who the people were, who had been hospitalized already, and who was, um, was still needing to be transferred. And so there were breakdowns administratively, which made it very difficult because all of the staff who normally worked there were no longer there. So uh, together we did um, uh, incredible work and because she is on the phone, uh, although not her entire team that was doing the work, but I wanna pass through my thanks to uh, Winnie Doyle. Uh, her team at St. Joe's did an incredible job with a lot of other partners, uh, but they did a great job of uh, maintaining the safety of, of those involved and in helping us through this. And I also wanna pass on my thanks to our paramedic chief, uh, Mike Sanderson, whose team actually did the transfer over the course of uh, 4.45 in the afternoon till about 12.45 in the morning uh, on Saturday. So I wanted to share that. Uh, we did have that debrief this week, a little bit of that information, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Richardson who can continue to share a bit of that as well as our overall case uh, numbers of COVID-19 in the community. Thanks very much, Paul. So I, I will just give you a very brief update as to where we're at uh, with our case numbers today and then go on to talk a little bit more about the Roslyn. So it, we're at 613 cases today as of uh, 9 a.m. And that's 606 lab confirmed, seven probable. Of those 613, 415 of them or 68% are resolved. And uh, that's a very good number. We wanna keep seeing that climb as we go forward because it means that the number of new cases having, happening every day is sitting below 10, around about eight would be where we might sit the last few days while people are getting better uh, for 
those that have been infected already. Unfortunately, we have now had 30 deaths. There are no new deaths, but uh, that is the number of deaths we've had primarily amongst those who are quite vulnerable to this illness, those are who are over 65, those who have chronic medical conditions, um, who uh, we are of course working very hard to protect during this, uh, this response. We have six institutional outbreaks that's down from a, a much larger number earlier this week. Um, many of those, as you'll recall, were, were small outbreaks in that there may be only one or two people involved and were the results of all the, the mass testing that was done are primarily due to the mass testing Testing that was done in long-term care facilities, which helped to identify where um, there were some staff or perhaps an, a resident who was ill, but we weren't really seeing any transmission beyond that. And there've been no further community outbreaks at this point. So just to go on and talk a little bit more about cases within the Roslyn, we have had 66 residents in total associated with the Roslyn that have been identified as positive. While it's a 64-bed um, facility, there was some um, additional residents that came in while other residents were out of the facility, uh, leading us to a 66 uh, number in total. 64 of those are confirmed as positive and two of them are living as we understand it within the community or hotels. Two have been negative um, throughout. There are four deaths and no new deaths, as I said earlier, that uh, have been associated with this facility. Overall, 20 staff who worked in the facility. Now, those could be the, the, the staff of the Roslyn per se, or they may be staff who were part of home and community care, the other service providing organizations who came in to provide uh, care in the Roslyn. As you've heard from Paul, um, we went through this process and did do another infection prevention and control audit, which we conducted jointly with St. Joe's Hamilton. St. Joe's has been supporting um, this home throughout. And in those uh, inspections that we did jointly, we did note a number of issues around PPE use, as Paul's talked about, around compliance with cleaning, um, issues in terms of physical spacing, so getting that physical distancing for clients, issues with um, really screening the residents for illness. And again, Paul's talked about how these are, many of them are, are independent living and may come and go, uh, but still no screening of them on a daily basis or um, not as complete screening. And then again, screening of staff or others that may come and go out of the home to make sure that nobody who was symptomatic was coming in and out. So as we went back in and saw um, the facility, they weren't able to come into compliance with those requirements quickly. And so as a result, we issued an order under the Health Protection and Promotion Act on May 14th to have them come into compliance. We did test uh, quite quickly all of the individuals in this facility. When the first two people were identified, um, after the first one, we asked EMS, our paramedic partners, who have been just fabulous about going out to situations such as this, to do some testing of the close contacts of that first initial case. And when they were in the facility, they identified that they had significant concerns about others being symptomatic, as well as uh, noting some of the infection prevention and control issues. And so we decided to recommend full testing of all of the um, residents and staff who were in the facility. And that is why we had the results so quickly. That uh, testing was again carried out by our EMS colleagues on the Tuesday and, uh, and we had the, the results soon after. Just um, to know as well today, um, you know, as we went through that experience, we did go out and complete inspections on seven other homes that are associated with this, uh, with this facility. And um, in looking at those, we are issuing orders today for four additional facilities, again, related to concerns around primarily infection prevention and control, um, issues around screening, those sorts of things. And so again, we want to make sure that there, we're underscoring the reasons uh, why this is so very important. And you'll know we've been talking about the importance of these things for many weeks. We began with initial education campaigns that went out to all retirement homes, long-term care homes. There is a directive that has been issued by the ministry some time ago, Directive to five, which requires retirement homes to do as much as possible. That is uh, all the actions that are required for long-term care homes. And we had, of course, put in place an order for uh, the Roslyn earlier and asked them to come into compliance, which initially they had done. Um, we're also going to extend mass testing uh, to take place at these, uh, at four of the homes at Montgomery Lodge, Northview Seniors, Dundas Retirement Home and Cathmar Manor, and are expecting to begin to get those results either later this afternoon or sometime over the weekend. Um, we are asked at times about when residents may be able to go back to the Roslyn. There is that order still outstanding. 
in terms of the infection prevention and control issues. So things like deep cleaning needs to take place um, and other things uh, that are required. And so we would want all of that to be in place before anybody was to go back. But a, uh, as well acknowledging that really these, these homes are overseen by the Retirement Homes Regulatory Authority who uh, understand, oversee the retirement home uh, system, if you, if you will, within the province. And we know the RHRA has been involved and has um, a number of conditions that they have for uh, returning to this home as well. And so they're the best to speak to those. So I think that's probably as much as I'll say at this point, but I know Rob, you, you know, want to talk more about the, the debrief that we had and some of the recommendations as we go forward. So I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, so a few comments and um, I will uh, try to um, summarize the recommendations that our team uh, has uh, brought forward. Maybe I could begin by saying though that uh, throughout the pandemic, hospital staff and doctors uh, have stepped up to extend their expertise and support on the ground in the area's long-term care homes, retirement homes, um, and in other congregate settings. While hospitals uh, specifically do not have oversight over these uh, um, living uh, places, we are doing this without hesitation, um, not just to align with provincial policy and directions, but um, more importantly, because we think it's the right thing to do. The severity of the situation at the Rossland Retirement Residence cannot be understated. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the, um, decanting that home was um, critical for the well-being of the residents uh, who were living there uh, and immediate action had to be taken. Over the past few days, representatives from Public Health, St. Joe's, um, Lynn Home and Community Care and Hamilton Health Sciences uh, reviewed the various events uh, that took place at the Rosslyn home uh, and they presented a series of recommendations um, to uh, Paul and Elizabeth and I, uh, who are the uh, primary contacts at the Ontario West um, command table. Um, those recommendations have now been shared with the Ontario West branch of Ontario Health. Uh, and specifically, those recommendations call for the testing of residents, both residents and healthcare workers in retirement homes, focusing first on those homes which are considered uh, high risk uh, with a plan ultimately to spread to other um, high risk congregate settings. The proactive identification of an alternative healthcare facility that can be used in a crisis situation where uh, we you know, see another uh, large cohort of people needing to be decanted from uh, one place to another. Um, clear accountability roles and responsibilities of those who operate, manage, and work in congregate settings. Um, basic standards and requirements for physicians who provide care uh, to residents in congregate settings. A stronger regulatory regime uh, for retirement homes. Uh, the completion of functional assessments uh, again, for congregate settings deemed high risk uh, in the early going, to review things like administrative structures, medication systems, the medical model, et cetera. Uh, formal, uh, the development of a formal structure at the municipal level to oversee um, any possible future decantings. Uh, this would be a sort of command management structure, which uh, municipalities are very good at. Uh, we know that um, in these kinds of situations, first responders, police, ambulance, fire, all have a role to play. And we think that um, the city has is in the best position to coordinate these kinds of operations going forward. Um, and at the, within the hospital setting, development of a more formal infrastructure to support congregate settings to ensure um, a coordinated response. So I think um, really what that means is that uh, we are, if we are going to be in this business for some time, uh, I think we are going to have to set up 
uh, some formal uh, dedicated resources uh, to looking after this. This is not something that we can continue to do as a uh, off the side of our desk, as they say. Um, you know, as you know, people can't have dual roles. We need to have people who are dedicated to this if uh, we are to uh, sustain this for any period of time looking ahead. Um, and I think also an acknowledgement of the limitations of hospitals to address these issues uh, moving forward. And I think, you know, particularly as we look across the broader region, some of the smaller municipalities uh, and counties, I think we'll have a great difficulty uh, in doing the kinds of things which we can do uh, in a more urban setting. Uh, although having said that, uh, for you know urban hospitals to to uh, try to do this for the whole of the region uh, is equally uh, difficult. So I just think um, there's no doubt hospitals are an important resource and a willing partner to try to step in, but we cannot be all things to all people. Locally, uh, the partners here today and others in our network uh, will be moving forward with the recommendations. Uh, which we can action. So there's a, a number uh, of the things that I've enumerated that I think we can uh, bring into being. Uh, some of the other things I think are squarely within the purview of the province uh, for their consideration. Uh, I think you know we have to think about how we can do more for these vulnerable um, people um, and how they're treated in the context of uh, the entire health system. We will certainly continue to work with the province to do uh, our part and continue to uh, do whatever we can to try to help them uh, uh, understand the situation on the ground. Uh, that concludes my remarks. Uh, back to you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I think we just have you on mute there. I'm sorry. Yes, you do. Yeah, I just Thank unmuted you. myself. Thanks. Um, let me just get rid of this. Thank you. Uh, yes, Rob, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Elizabeth and uh, Paul. I mean, uh, the, the, this really highlights the, uh, the, the kind of lack of uh, fundamental responsibility in this in this area that, uh, you know, everyone's got a little piece of it, but no one has the ultimate uh, authority to uh, to take uh, direct action to uh, protect these uh, these residents in these retirement homes and uh, I, would, I would I would imagine that most of them are doing just fine but uh, you know there are some cases where owners or operators are not doing what they're required to do and uh, and we it, it, lend, it leads itself to uh, situations like this so certainly call on the province to put more teeth into the regulatory regime so that uh, th these things can be prevented uh, well in advance of uh, them getting to this point. Uh, I'd like to wrap up this week uh, by giving a quick shout out to the following uh, organizations that uh, are going above and beyond uh, in our community to uh, be helpful and help one another. I, I'm going to single out John Ellison. You'll know John Ellison from uh, his 1960s hit, uh, Some Kind of Wonderful. Uh, John lives in Dundas and uh, he's uh, made a career out of that, uh, that hit and, num and a number of other performances and work that he does in our community. But he's also written a new song. It's called uh, We're Showing the World, uh, all aimed towards uh, raising money for Hamilton Health Sciences. So if you want to hear the song or get more information on how to donate, uh, please go to hamiltonhealth.ca slash Ellison and you can donate or hear the tune and uh, help Hamilton Health Sciences raise some funds to, uh, to do some good works in our community. Um, uh, also gonna give a shout out to uh, the uh, St. John's Anglican Church. It's holding a bottle drive to raise money for the mission services of Hamilton on Monday. So uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on June the 1st, mission services will have that bottle drive. Donors are asked to bring empty wine, liquor, and beer bottles to the parking lot at uh, St. John's at 272 Wilson Street East. And if uh, the lineups at the beer store and the liquor store are any indicator, uh, people are consuming plenty. So there's probably gonna be lots of empties out there. So uh, bring them to uh, 272 uh, Wilson Street East and uh, they can take care of those for you and help raise some money for the, uh, the cause as well. For more information on that, you can call 905-648-1433. And uh, a thank you goes out to everyone at St. John's for giving Mission Services a helping hand. So well done. 
Uh, Jazz, it's now over to you for some media questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, we do have a number of media partners on the phone today. We'll start with one question and one follow-up for everyone. First question goes to Dan Takama from CBC Hamilton. Dan, you can go ahead. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thanks, Jasmine. All right. Um, we've tried repeatedly to get in contact with Roz, and we, we haven't heard anything back. So I'm wondering, to, to whoever can answer this best, what has management or the, the home's owners, what explanation have they given the city or different partners about how this situation was able to get as bad as it was? Um, yeah, so I, I don't have an answer to that question. And I, I really wouldn't want to uh, try to represent um, what the management or the operators of uh, those retirement homes um, are expressing as their uh, views uh, or you know their operating practices. I, I think they're the only ones uh, who can really appropriately answer that question. Dan, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Rob, I'll go back to you then on these uh, on the review. Can you kind of? Uh, it was kind of a high-level uh, run through there, and I know you were trying to kind of synthesize somewhat of a complicated thing. But I just want to make sure I understand what uh, sort of these recommendations mean in Hamilton specifically. I know that there's some actions that locally we can take, and some that re uh, rely on other bodies. So, can you kind of run me through that again? um sure did you you want me to go through not not the actual list the whole list but uh, you mentioned that some of these things are local things so can you kind of point to what those might be and and uh make sure i understand kind of what yeah. exactly will be happening out of this so i think the things that are within uh our control uh and the lessons uh, that you know we're trying we've tried to um glean from the experience that we went through a week ago um, I guess uh, testing of residents uh, and healthcare workers is certainly something we can get going on uh, working uh, with public health. Um, working at getting a, um, an alternative uh, healthcare facility. So, um, you know, that, that's basically uh, proactively going out uh, into the community and finding space uh, that we can fit up uh, to act as a, an appropriate receptacle, receiving place uh, for potential future situations like this. Uh, I mean, frankly, um, we would rather not fill up our hospitals um, with all of these folks. Uh, of course, if they need acute care, they should come to the hospital, uh, but we'd rather not use those resources up on people who don't need acute care. And so if we could find some alternative spots uh, to decant into, uh, I think that would be highly desirable. So that's something else I think that we can get going on. Um, I mean, having said that, uh, I don't think it's any secret that we, you know, uh, as we were preparing for the pandemic, we, we had looked at some alternative healthcare facilities within the city. So. I think we need to uh, get back on to that, those efforts. Um, completion of functional assessments. Um, I think that's another thing we can get going on. Of course, uh, that will require the uh, collaboration and cooperation of the operators of, of homes. Uh, but assuming we've got that, I think we can get on uh, with proactively doing that work. Uh, the form, getting, working with the city to get a form, formal um, command management uh, group together. In fact, Paul Johnson has already done that uh, and his team, so that's great. We know that if it happens again, uh, there, there will be a command table hosted by the city, which has an ability to marshal uh, first responders and other resources to help us to do that uh, quickly. Uh, and I think uh, for us within hospitals to uh, start to, you know, uh, create uh, dedicated resources uh, towards these initiatives is another thing that we, we uh, can get started on. Thanks, Rob. 
Thanks, Rob. Next question for Samantha Craigs. Samantha, you can go ahead. Um, hi there. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, my question is either for Mr. Mayor or Mr. Johnson, but I think it's uh, for Mr. Mayor. Um, I know that that uh, Mike Zagarek has has estimated that if things didn't get back to normal by the end of May in terms of revenue and uh, and spending, that the city was looking at to round up a twenty three million dollar deficit. Um, what is the updated number now now that we are coming up on the end of May and it looks like things won't be back to normal what, what, what is the updated number in terms of our def deficit uh, I don't have an updated number for you right now I think that that's the that was that was the estimate I think there there's an anticipation that that will be the number for that time period uh, there are some additional estimates depending on uh, you know how much longer this goes and how much longer the recovery goes so there were some uh, Estimates given to the uh, federal and provincial uh, MPs and MPPs. Uh, the number ranges anywhere from the uh, the twenty three million dollar if this is where it ends to uh, potentially one hundred and twenty two million dollars if it goes you know into a year time span. And so it's all based on you know current loss of revenue uh, in our culture and rec programs, our transit program right now. Uh, the additional expenses that we've incurred in terms of PPE and projections forward and what that might mean as we return to work and all the other impacts that uh, that are happening. So we won't have actuals at this point, but uh, we certainly have estimates and and all of it deemed to you know impact not necessarily this budget year, but uh, but next budget. So uh, obviously that that'll be a deficit for uh, for this current budget year, and that that's a deficit that we're trying to get our federal and provincial partners to consider covering. Okay. Um, my other question was for Mr. Johnson. You mentioned that report that uh, will be made public shortly, which I'm keen to see. Um, what do you hope is achieved by the public getting a look at what's been happening at the EOC and the decisions that are being made? Uh, two things. Uh, just to recognize uh, how much COVID-19 is going to change the way business happens. Uh, secondly, uh, how long it's going to take for some of those uh, those changes to be implemented, that this is not, uh, we're not dropping it on May the 27th because suddenly on May the 28th, everything just comes back to life. We are bringing forward uh, public documents so people can see the significant amount of work that it takes to make safe our environments. Uh, some of what won't change for a very long time, things will remain virtual, things will remain um, uh, done in, in different ways, but then also give a bit of that pathway through to what things might look like, uh, whether those are a number of weeks or a number of months out in the in the future. The other thing this will do is we're very clear and we outline in very clear ways uh, the variety of things that take place in every environment that the city operates. And so uh, whereas some of those are clearly focused towards our staff, their office environment, for instance, or how they operate safely within a vehicle, if there's more than one person in a vehicle, um, the other things are places where the public will come eventually. When we open City Hall, people will come inside. When we, have, when we open some of our other facilities, people will come in and it will clearly outline the kinds of things that they're going to be encountering uh, when they come to our facilities. Uh, there will be different physical layouts of our facility. There will be different uh, expectations on people uh, when they come. And so uh, life is going to be a little bit different. So those are those expectations that we expect uh, from, from the public. The other piece that's in this report without specificity because it's going to take us a little bit of time to get there is we're very clearly articulating to council that together staff uh, at times the emergency operations center uh, and council are going to have to turn their attention to some of the activities that the city will be undertaking which are going to be impacted significantly by COVID-19 for a long period of time and some examples of that are uh, issues like our transit system uh, issues like our housing and homelessness system uh, these congregate settings where life can't go back to normal. We operate two long-term care facilities, as you know. Uh, things along the lines of child care. If we're not at full capacity within our child care system, what does that mean for the rest of the community in terms of their ability to get back to work and do the things that we need to do and care for children and ensure that their development isn't, isn't hindered? So uh, this does a few things, uh, Samantha, in terms of letting the public know what's coming forward 
in terms of some policy and and as the mayor just uh, mentioned that are going to have budget implications as well as uh, just looking at, at at all that's going to go into the way we uh, we work as a community and uh, the final piece is it's a chance for us to explain why certain things we're doing uh, are, are, are more effective in stopping the spread of this uh, than perhaps the first thing that pops into people's minds, that the way we reconfigure our buildings, the way we really stress the physical distancing, that's the way you eliminate you eliminate that uh, that risk. Um, you know, everybody always jumps to what kind of PPE can we have, and in fact, those are the ways you modify the risk and you and you lower the risk when you have no other choice. But uh, we're going to do all the things we can that are um, that are that are able to keep everybody safe through those modifications. So there's lots in it. It is it is live now. Um, uh, while well, we've been speaking here, got some of the updates uh, from our clerks, so it's it's live and people can look at it. Uh, it's a long document because we have a lot of services here at the city and we've tried to be a bit comprehensive in letting people know what those were. All right, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Next question will be for Dale from CHCH. Dale, you can go ahead. Thanks guys for asking my uh, answering my questions and for helping uh, build the timeline leading up to the decanting. Um, I wanted to understand how, um, from the time that the Rossland passed their initial compliance of the first public order up until the second order was issued, how many times were they uh, inspected and checked to see that they were keeping up with um, their compliance of that first public order? So in terms of this, I'd have to get back to you exactly how many times we went in. There's a there's sort of different processes that have been put in place through the evolution of this. So we started off um, doing assessments that were city driven uh, and public health services driven in terms of going to each of the homes. So we began with an education process with correspondence and communication out to them. Then we went in and did a, an audit with them. So we went through all of the expectations and went over those with them. And then we did follow up audits with them to make sure that they had understood those and put those in place. And then we started a process that we've been asked to do by the province where all of the partners came together the hospital, public health, the regulatory authority for retirement homes and the Ministry of Long-Term Care for long-term care facilities, where all of us were pooling the information that we had. And so there are different inspections done by different groups. So the Retirement Home Regulatory Authority, for example, would do their inspections on whenever they thought they should be done. But checking in, we started to do a regular check-in with facilities to make sure that, that things were stable, things were going okay, and we would... Um, you know, address any concerns they had, ask them about their staffing, ask them about those things. So those were happening, if not uh, every couple of days, even in some cases up to day, at some periods of time up to daily in terms of those check-ins with them. And then when we became aware, um, we had plans to do a second round of these IPAC assessments and those were underway um, with the hospitals. We were doing them together so that they were well prepared if they had staff that needed to go into these facilities as we did have, for example, in um, Dundurn. Um, then we you know, began that process so they were well prepared. We had not yet gotten to these facilities uh, in that process, but they were scheduled to occur when the outbreak happened and we heard concerns about um, from our EMS coll colleagues, we went right in that, uh, that next day to do another inspection and then have uh, been continuing to follow up with them since then. Did you want to ask a follow-up question, Dale? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to know from our, maybe perhaps uh, our healthcare providers, uh, how many current Roslyn residents are in critical care uh, for COVID-19 or on a ventilator? Um, for St. Joe's, um, there isn't any patients um, in critical care or on a ventilator. Um, yeah, um, unfortunately, I can't, uh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. So um, if it's uh, important to we we will get back to you on it. Thank you. Thanks. Next question will be for Joanna from the Hamilton Spectator. Joanna, you can go ahead. 
Hi, thanks so much for taking my questions. Um, my first question is, um, the province uh, said uh, today that there's going to be testing this weekend in uh, seniors' homes, particularly retirement homes, and the redoing long-term care testing. Is that going on in Hamilton this weekend, and do you have the resources for that? Hi, Joanna, why don't I take that one? Um, in terms of, we could never do everything all in one weekend. That's just not doable in terms of the scope and scale. We had 20,000 test results just to put it in. And as my uh, director of operations, Michelle Baird said, that's essentially work that we would handle in the course of a year uh, usually. And so just even handling those results um, is challenging. So that will t would take some time to put in place. What we are focused on right now is the highest risk facilities. And that's the uh, four facilities that I outlined uh, uh, earlier on, and we are in over the course of this weekend doing all of that testing. And the second thing that the province uh, and the federal government mentioned is important is contact tracing. So what is your ability uh, to do contact tracing, particularly when you have so many patients just around one uh, facility alone? Have you called in some of that federal government help? Do you have the resources to do that? Have you been able to trace down the visitors and the, the people in the, the two people in the hotel? Like, are, how are you able to do that contact tracing? Thanks, Joanna. It, you know, and I appreciate your recognition of just the scope and scale that these sorts of responses uh, do require. So in terms of contact tracing in Hamilton, we're very fortunate as a, as a moderate to larger sized health unit that we have a number of resources and I, my colleagues have been just fantastic about stepping up to the plate and being flexible and working in these new areas. You know, we have uh, nurses who would normally be doing things related to physical activity or working with new families and instead they are making calls to cases and to contacts to follow up and doing just remarkable work. So these um, these the case and contact tracing on a day by day basis it is it is a fair it's a fairly large operation it's a, a good portion of the staff that have been rededicated to uh, COVID-19 and they have been able to stay on top of, of the, the scope of it. We continue to look at whether there, there are others or aspects that um, could be handled by others and we've been fortunate to get some support around some of the, the, um, the data management from people like the library and from our other colleagues within the city within human resources. We've been fortunate to get um, offers of help from med students. We've been fortunate to, to get the offers from Public Health Ontario, whether it's to do training related to those things. And to date, we have managed to handle it with our own staff um, as we go forward. And we continue to look at it and project the number of people we would need to do that. It was very difficult when all of the, the results came in so quickly from the Roslyn. When you look at the mass testing that went on in long-term care homes, by far the vast, vast, vast majority of those tests were negative. And so it doesn't have that ongoing monitoring component. It doesn't have all the contacts to follow up. But when it came to uh, those results from the Roslyn, because it, again, we were trying to get information around people who had been transferred from one facility to another facility. It was very difficult to do that in a timely way. It um, wasn't necessarily the number of people we might have dedicated to that, as it was just, again, the complexity of the situation. And so our staff have worked through all of that to, to get back on top of that. So for now, our plan is to continue to use public health services staff to do that. But we continue in dialogue with the province and, and looking at models that people have put together. There's some discussion about using apps to do it, for example, in Ottawa has developed and adopted an app. The province is looking at another app. So it is an area that's rapidly evolving and we'll continue to, uh, to keep up to date so we can make sure we're on top of it. It's absolutely a pillar when it comes to controlling this virus and controlling the spread. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Next question is for Con Katrina Clark from the Hamilton Spectator. Katrina, you can go ahead. Hi there, my question's about the Roslyn and contact tracing specifically. I'm wondering if visitors were being allowed into the Roslyn sort of in the weeks leading up to the outbreak and if all contract tracing has been completed for those visitors. Thanks, Katrina. You'll recall I'd uh, made some comments. I think it uh, was on Thursday and perhaps even earlier about the whole issue of visitors at the Roslyn. And so um, we became aware, we, we know in retirement homes, just like in long-term care homes, they've been, been asked to not have any visitors in place unless they're essential. And so there are some circumstances where people would be um, considered essential visitors. And the other thing is sometimes there are people coming in to provide additional aspects of care that we may not know about. So we became aware from a few people when we were doing the follow-up calls um, that there were 
some concerns there had been some people in and there's no visitors log in place. And so we weren't able to, you know, we, we could identify who people were able to tell us about, but not all of the residents were able to tell us about who might have been there. So we did put out, um, I believe it was Wednesday night and Thursday saying that if there was anybody who had been at the Roslyn that we hadn't been able to get in touch with that we asked them to immediately self isolate and to give us a call and particularly if they had any symptoms whatsoever related to COVID and remembering that that symptom list is now quite extensive related to COVID-19 to give us a call at our, um, our assessment center hotline and we would get them in and get them tested as soon as possible. Thank you. And my second question, uh, in terms of the evac evacuation, I'd like to know who, uh, which authority, was it the city, was it public health, who was in charge of the evacuation and was anyone who is involved in management or operating um, the Roslyn, was anyone from the Roslyn there? I think I can I can start with that and then uh, Winnie um, maybe ask you to to, to jump in uh, as as well. So <laughs> the call in the afternoon, the retirement home is is ultimately who needed to uh, okay and say yes, we wanted to go ahead with that. Um, there were many elements of it. So in terms of one single entity uh, overseeing the entire operation. Um, uh, not so. It was a collective effort, and and as you you heard from Rob, uh, the sense is that uh, we're going to tighten up the overall um, what we call incident management system or an IMS structure around it. But um, yes, uh, individuals from the Roslyn were were involved, and uh, at no time did we take over the facility. And in fact, um, at the tail end of it, when when we were uh, leaving, having done checks and everything else, um, it was not our our job to secure the building. And I know Winnie will talk a bit to that too, because it was part of the debriefing. Mm -hmm. uh, that facility was always the Roslands to own and operate and manage, uh, maintained that way. And after the operation continued that way as well. So certainly from a municipal perspective, the largest uh, portion of the operation was uh, through paramedic service. Uh, they did it, use a command uh, model for this as they do with mass transportation of patients when it's not uh, uh, a sort of a 911 emergency call. So they, they they did shuttle people through uh, teams of uh, paramedics coming down and shuttling people to the two hospitals. Uh, so I know that um, our paramedics use their structure to work through that. And I know that St. Joe's was on site uh, leading uh, some of the uh, important, but um, uh, you know, challenging work of ensuring that uh, we had a good handle on, on who was where, including those who had already been transported to hospital earlier in the week. But uh, Winnie, I'm gonna let you, um, I continue on with just a few because I know you had a few of those uh, choice comments in terms of what uh, could work better in terms of that process uh, after the fact. Yes, so just to add to what Paul has uh, mentioned, um, the, the St. Joe's team were on site. Um, there were some Lynn Home and Community staff also assisting in the home, and we worked very closely with the uh, Chief of EMS, Mike Sanderson. His team did a first-class job. The police were involved in helping... Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, um, the patients being moved from the Rosalind and then both of the hospitals, Hamilton Health Sciences and St. Joe's, we all worked together um, to uh, manage the, the transfer of the patients. Katrina, did you wanna ask a follow-up question? I think that was my follow-up Oh, question. my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. Everyone's laughing. Oh. Okay, Mr. Mayor, that's the end of our media questions. Um, over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for your participation uh, today. And uh, hopefully we've shared some information that will uh, enlighten uh, some of the activities that have happened over the last little while. Uh, we wanna thank uh, Rosalie Visitors and Georgia Will and our amazing American Sign Language interpreters and uh, 30, 30 or 45 minute workout uh, leaders. Thank you for your uh, ongoing work. Uh, thank you to the entire Bill, the entire Cable 14 team and Bill Custers uh, for continuing to help us uh, produce this broadcast and McLean Media to make sure that it uh, runs as smoothly as possible. And of course, as we do every, uh, every week, we, we thank all of our essential workers, our frontline healthcare workers in the hospitals, the paramedics, the uh, police officers, grocery store workers, pharmacists, truck drivers, 
uh, janitors, cleaning staff, bus operators, food manufacturers are working hard out there to keep the uh, production lines going, firefighters and other imperative frontline workers, all of them continuing to keep our uh, economy and our, our, our community functional and uh, doing that at, at some risk each and every day, obviously with uh, all the appropriate protections in place. And uh, you know, we remind you that uh, do not uh, avoid getting uh, your underlying health care issues looked after. We have health care providers with us today. Uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll say that, uh, you know, COVID-19 is not a reason to ignore other health issues that you're having that need, uh, you know, hospital or critical care or acute care. So don't ignore your other health issues because you worry about COVID-19. They are well separated. All the uh, paramedics have all the proper equipment to ensure that uh, you're protected from that should you uh, not have that, uh, but uh, you need to look after all your other health care needs as well. So don't uh, dismiss that from uh, being a necessary thing to do. If you need a doctor, call a doctor. If you need paramedics, call the ambulance. Uh, if you need health care at uh, emergency, get to emergency. Beyond that, if you're not feeling well and you had COVID, uh, we're still asking you to stay home as much as possible. This has not changed. We're still in the midst of a, an emergency in the province of Ontario. Uh, we're in the midst of an emergency in the city of Hamilton and probably all communities right throughout the province. Uh, that means, uh, you know, if you don't have to go elsewhere, uh, maintain that physical separation, stay home as much as you can. I know that we're going to have fantastic Trillium Awards handed out this year because gardens are going to be spectacular. Everyone has lots of time to do a lot of gardening and that's a good thing. And lots of things are also open, but when you do access them, just remember that physical distancing, as Paul pointed out earlier, is probably the best thing that we can do to avoid spreading this virus or sharing this uh, virus with anyone else. So don't forget about that and don't forget about the hand washing and all the other public health requirements that are uh, out there. But through all of that, uh, try and enjoy your weekend. Uh, there are lots of trails open, lots of uh, spaces where you can now uh, get to and go to. Tennis is available, golf is available. I'm a happy camper. I'm gonna hopefully play some tennis this weekend. So get busy, enjoy yourselves. It looks like it's gonna be a fantastic weekend. And uh, we look forward to talking to you on Monday at our next media update. Thank you all for participating.